boom goes the apogee, or dynamite, or something like this. Anyways, here's the apogee. Hey, Julian Krauss here, and today I'm going to have a look at the apogee. You know I'm going to do this the whole review, right? Maybe not. Live in fear. Today we're going to have a detailed look at the Apogee Boom, check out its features and audio performance. Let's hop right in and start on the hardware side before taking a look at the software and some special features like real-time audio processing. The Boom is a small to medium-sized interface, here it is compared to a Focusrite Scarlett Solo. The I.O. of the Boom is pretty straightforward. On the front you get two inputs, a microphone and line level combo connector and a quarter inch TRS instrument slash line level input. I'm not entirely sure why Apogee went with just one microphone input, it costs next to nothing to have a second mic input and I would have really liked to see that here. On the far right you can find an encoder knob which you can push to cycle between the functions and turn to for example control the main out, headphone volume or change the input gain. I want to note that when you plug in headphones the main output is automatically muted and only your headphones are active. If you want to hear anything from your studio monitors again you have to unplug your headphones. I think it would have been better if you had a toggle in the software that lets you decide between your studio monitors and your headphones, but that's sadly not the case. On the right side you can also find a small level meter which is virtually useless because it's so tiny and only has 5 LEDs which is not enough for setting your level precisely. The level meter also does show you where you have set your output volume at, but for some reason it does not do the same on the input, so just looking at your interface you have no idea where you have your gain set at. I really hope that they can improve that via a firmware update. Switching to the back you can find a Kensington locking point, a USB-C connection and a quarter inch headphone jack on the left hand side. On the right side you get two quarter inch TRS balanced outputs and that's about it. I quickly want to talk about the build quality because it is a bit weird. The main body is made out of a solid metal and that makes the interface feel very sturdy. But the front and the back plate are out of plastic, like the really cheap kind of plastic. The knob also does not feel confident inspiring and that feels more like a part from a $50 interface. So that makes the interface feel a bit cheap, despite its solid construction. As always I tried to have a look inside the interface but was first greeted with special screws and then plastic tabs which hold on the front and the back and so there was no way to disassemble the interface without destroying it. That's a shame, so the claimed legendary conversion stays hidden, but not to worry, it's more about the real world performance of the interface anyways, so let's take a look at that next. Frequency response time and as you can see at the maximum gain setting, the response does show some amount of roll off in the low and high frequencies. The low frequency area is not really of concern, but the high frequency roll off is on the verge of becoming audible. Don't expect this to really stick out, but it does mean that with dynamic mics, the very high end will be ever so slightly quieter. From an interface in this price range, I would have expected a flatter response here. At a lower gain setting, the response does get much flatter, and that's much more in line with what I like to see. In terms of distortion, the Apogee Boom fares quite well, and distortion components on the mic input only exist about 90 decibels below the test signal, which I consider to be inaudible. Dynamic range is the ratio of the highest signal the interface can capture and its noise floor, and you want this to be as big as possible. Here the Apogee Boom managed to hit a cool 113 dBA, which in my book is great and it is unlikely that you will ever be limited by the dynamic range of the boom. How about preamp noise? I'm talking into a low sensitive dynamic microphone, plugged straight into the Apogee Boom and this is pretty much a worst case scenario for the mic preamp. I'll let you listen to the noise flow of this setup. And here a little bit amplified in comparison to some other interfaces. You can definitely hear quite a bit more noise with the Apogee Boom and I have to confess I'm a bit surprised by that. But this is also backed by my measurements. As you can see the Boom comes in at about minus 122 dB UA weighted and that's on average 7 dB more noise than what you would find on competing and even cheaper interfaces. If you only use condenser microphones this is not an issue as the mic is the limiting factor in terms of noise performance. But with dynamic microphones the preamp noise can be very important as you can hear right now. Yes, you could improve the situation noticeably by using a cloud fed headlifter but you really shouldn't need to rely on an additional inline preamp on an interface in this price range. 
On a more positive note, the Apogee Boom has quite a bit of gain, so it can easily bring your low sensitive dynamic microphones up to a proper recording level. Although you probably wouldn't want to use these kind of mics with the Apogee Boom because of the aforementioned preamp noise. Let's just quickly look at the line input because it is very similar to the mic input. Distortion is lower than minus 90 dB and even drops to minus 100 at your typical recording level. So don't worry about distortion, the line level input is very clean. That also goes for the dynamic range. Here the Apogee Boom managed to reach 113 dBA and as mentioned before that's really good and there's virtually no chance that you will hear any noise from the line level input. Like at the low gain setting of the mic input, the frequency response is also pretty flat in the human hearing range. No complaints here. Okay, let's jump over to the output side of the interface and start with the main output. Here the frequency response is ruler flat in the audible range and that's now very much on point with what I like to see in the price range. Dynamic range performance once again is very good with about 114 dBA, so there's no way that you will hear any noise from the output under real world conditions. And distortion performance is also really good. The maximum output level could have been a bit stronger to match professional line level devices, but it's already quite good, so all fine. All in all, the main output on the Apogee Boom is quite nice and I would say that it is on the verge of being transparent, meaning that you do not hear the interface itself, just the audio that it is playing back. For the headphone output I was particularly intrigued by the advertised near zero ohm output impedance and while my measurements were slightly higher than their spec, about one ohm, this is quite excellent and that means that regardless which impedance your headphones have, they will sound exactly like they are designed to. This is augmented by a very flat frequency response, which is always great to see. The power side also looks quite good, with the exception of a very few special headphones, you should have no problem with the to drive your headphones to loud listening levels. And I'm just skipping over the distortion figures here, because in the real world there's no chance you will hear any non-linear distortion from the headphone output. The noise figures initially look alright, although they have just made it into the green category. While it is unlikely that you will hear this noise with over-ear headphones, with very sensitive ones or IEMs you can definitely start to perceive a slight constant background hiss. For an interface in its price range I would have expected a better performance here, as the Apogee Boom is outperformed by much cheaper interfaces in this regard. By the way, the audibility of noise of course heavily depends on the headphones you use, but I'm debating whether I should adjust the color categories for the headphone outputs slightly for all interfaces to have a stricter view on noise, as IEMs become more and more popular. Let me know what you think. The channel balance is perfect as the volume of the output is digitally controlled, so the left and right side of your headphones are always equally loud. The crosstalk isn't at all great and that means that the left channel slightly leaks into the right and vice versa. Even though this number is not extremely concerning, it could have definitely been better. Before we close out this video I want to show you the Apogee Control 2, which is the companion software for the Apogee Boom. One thing to note is that at least on my PC the Apogee Boom did not work without a driver. I had to install the software first before being able to use the interface. To be able to download the installer, Apogee forces you to give them your email address to receive the download link. In my opinion that's an absolute no-go, but maybe that's different for you. Starting on the left side you got your basic settings for the interface, like sample rate and buffer size, and you can also customize the meter's trajectory. For each input you can also choose the type of device that is used with it to optimize the input for the input type. Here is also where you find the toggle for the real-time effects, which I'll go over in a second, and additional functions like enabling phantom power and polarity inversion. At the bottom you got your mixing controls, where you can choose how much of each channel contributes to your overall mix, and this is where you can also add a loopback source. On the right you got your output controls, in the software you can individually control the volume of the main out and headphones, and you can also select which source you want to listen to, either direct monitor your inputs or listen to the whole mix. What is quite nice is that you can save your current setup as a snapshot to recall it later and that makes it quite easy to toggle between multiple setups. When you click the FX button, the Apogee channel FX will open up, revealing an EQ, compressor and drive. The EQ is pretty much straightforward, it's a 3-band EQ with an additional high pass. In my tests I noticed that the number of the high pass does not align with the real world response and it is always a bit lower, so if you set it to 100Hz the minus 3dB point is actually at minus 85Hz. Apogee, please fix. The compressor is very basic too, it has a threshold ratio and wet dry control for parallel compression. The drive adds gain and harmonics to your signal to make your sound more grungy and when pushed to the extreme even results in distortion. 
I really would have liked to see a few more controls for these effects, like attack and release on the compressor and a fully parametric EQ. And it would have also been really cool to have a gate and limiter too, as these are very useful in live streaming setups. But currently you don't get any of that. What's there does work quite well though, and actually none of the effects here add any additional delay to your monitoring and mixing. I measured the direct monitoring latency, and as usual it depends a bit on the sample rate. Even at 48kHz it is still low enough to not be perceptible, so that's great to see. If you're not using the built-in effects then your PC comes into play and then the so-called round-trip latency becomes much more important. You can see the times here I measured with 48kHz in different buffer sizes. These times are slightly higher than what I've found with other interfaces, but you can turn off the save mode which lowers the RTL by about 1.2 milliseconds. At higher sample rates the RTL improves slightly and here the times become more competitive. Sadly the real measured times were always slightly off to what the driver reported. Apogee, please fix. After all that, what's the verdict? I'm a bit torn. On one hand there are some really good things, like for example the extremely low distortion on all in and outputs, so there's virtually no chance that you will ever hear any distortion from this interface. The dynamic range is also very nice on the inputs and the main output. On the other hand there are some essential things that are really not that great and one of them is the preamp noise, which is quite a bit higher than what you would find on even cheaper interfaces. If you're using condenser microphones this is hardly an issue, but if you plan on using dynamic mics the preamp performance is quite important and then this might be a big deciding factor for you. I'm just not sure why you would build an interface at the boom's price point these days that has a such high preamp noise. Besides that the headphone output could have also had a bit less noise. With over-ear headphones it's mostly inaudible, but with more sensitive headphones and especially in-ear monitors you will hear some slight background hiss. Again, why this is a thing on a mid-range interface, I don't know. On a more positive note, as advertised the output impedance is very low and that's offering a high amount of frequency response accuracy. That's always great to see. The Apogee control center I found to be quite nice as it offers you the option to mix together different sound sources, include loopback and all that while retaining its real-time monitoring capability. Additionally the offers some real-time audio processing that is implemented quite nicely, but there's just not much there of it. Only the EQ, compressor and drive effect. The EQ is not even a fully parametric one, the compressor doesn't let you adjust attack and release times and I would have liked to see some more useful effects like a gate or a limiter. I'm not sure if that's something that can be added in the future via a firmware update, but as of now the real time processing is kinda limited. Kinda limited is also the IO of the interface. You only have one microphone input and for the price it wouldn't have hurt to have a second one. So a few pros but also several cons for this interface and you have to decide if that's worth the money for you. Please give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it, subscribe for more reviews and I will see you all in the next one.